ailleurs, en dehors même de l'esprit humain, dans des formes sociales, dans des rapports de production, dans des luttes de classe, etc. This is the Armchair Theorists. I'm Tyler Mraz, and I'm here with Nicholas Tolliver. We're here to give you a new episode today, specifically on Michel Foucault and his work on Discipline and Punish. As we usually try to do, we'll touch on a lot of other things, but we'll be focusing mainly on his work. This book kind of rides the line between philosophy, social critique, sociology, history. I think essentially he's talking about a genealogy of, of criminal justice in prisons. I think we should also uh, situate him in this big debate that he's talking about. Because it's not like he just decided one day that he's going to begin talking about crime and, and punishment. He, he's engaging in this larger debate that was going on around the, well, started at least in the 1950s and the 1960s, the revisionists and the anti-revisionists. The revisionists being Foucault, Foucault's camp and the anti-revisionists representing uh, traditional ideas of history. The normal narrative is that there was this transition between cruel forms of punishment into more humane and less yeah, arbitrary forms of punishment, right? And it was assumed just to be like a almost like a natural progression of human institution and, and portrayed as a, as a sort of a moral movement. And like a natural evolution, too, of like people one day realize that they weren't going to like just torture people willy-nilly sort of engaging that same ideology of like a, a civilization starting off violent and then progressing into this more civic, uh, reasonable and rational civilization, just like uh, the one we have. And so I think from the, and then from that perspective, prison is like a natural and humane outcome of that legacy of development. And, and that's what Foucault is, uh, is essentially what he's to disprove or discredit. I think just uh, the opinion of the general public as it appears in, in most media, like movies and whatnot, that back then is when we were like arbitrarily cruel and we had these insane torture mechanisms and, and everyone's fascinated with all the tools of torture from, from like medieval times, you know? Oh yeah. Do you ever go to the um, torture museum of like all these horrible, like any like Renaissance fair I feel like has that too. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go to a lot of Renaissance fairs and a huge, one of the larger attractions would be the the torture museum where they would have all these tools found that were once used to cut people's heads off, cut people open, yeah. pull people apart and whatnot. These crazy technologies. And, um, and that's where Foucault just... like really starts his book off too, is like with that horrible like torture stuff. And which sort of, I think, feeds into that, that popular fantasizing of, of, a, of historical very, torture, you know? He very much, yeah, consciously leans into that, the shock value of that. He says that torture is a technique. It is not an extreme expression of lawless rage. Yeah. So I think we can so commonly, when, when you see torture, it's so easy to see the rage in it and see the, the senseless brutality of it. Yeah. We it's excess. That we should, yeah, it's excess. It's vileness. And so I think we get caught up in the emotions of it, but we, we, and we fail to perceive it as also a, that, that is like a technique. Um, I feel like, like it, it's the same thing with terrorism, too, where we see the, the senselessness of it, but sometimes people f fail to see it as a, a political technique for sure. as well. It serves a function, and Foucault shows us exactly what functions it's serving. Well, we can talk about his methodology, right? How he starts, the way he starts the book is sort of outlining his intentions and his the methods or the means he's going to use to uh, deconstruct all these these histories he gives us or these genealogies i he gives us the studies for general rules that i think are important to touch on number one being to regard punishment as a complex social function uh maybe we can talk about each one i think that the the first two kind of go hand in hand as yeah, uh yeah. regard punishment as a political tactic if we see it as not just something juridical but also something that's about controlling the population. Punishment as a normative, like, like as a functioning system. I feel like people usually uh, are think pretty one-dimensionally about punishment, and Foucault's just warning us against that. Number three is as follows. It says, make the technology of power the very principle of both the humanization of the penal system and the knowledge of man. 
it's I feel like it's all about technology the power of influence the development of our penal justice system our whole criminal justice system is built around the evolution the technology of power the technology of power is a huge concept in Foucault's in this discipline and punishment it doesn't surprise me that it makes a, an appearance here in his four general rules for the study let's move on to the fourth one the try to discover whether this entry of the soul onto the scene of penal justice and with its insertion in legal practices of a whole corpus of scientific knowledge is not the effect of a transformation of the way in which the body itself is invested by power relations. This has to do with his whole idea about body and object relations, or just object relations and power, and how power yeah. manifests itself through these object relations. Because discipline is all about the body. Right, it's all about positioning the body with other yeah. objects, and I think the relationship between the body and the subject, right. and how, that, that big... how that relationship is invested with power relations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those are the four main points he's trying to make. I think just to just get that into people's heads as they continue reading. You want to say anything else before we continue? Uh, no, I think I think we can just jump to the next section. Uh, so I think the way we're going to do it is just by. Starting with, uh, because like we said that Foucault, what, what he's really doing is giving us a genealogy or a sort of outline of these technologies of power and the various modalities that they assume. And he starts us off with a, a, pretty, a pretty jarring first section. He starts it off with uh, Damien the Regicide, the guy who tried to kill the king of France and his, yeah. his brutal torture and, and execution. In which he is right. literally ripped like limb from limb. Piece by piece. And then they cut straight to um, the schedule of a prison about a hundred years later. And it, he kind of opens with, how did we get from the, this graphic public torture and death to this very regimented penal system? Just to answer that question, he sort of goes into a deep dive on... on this technology of power, the technology of power being torture and public execution. With torture, he says, from the judicial torture to the execution, the body has produced and reproduced the truth of the crime, or rather it constitutes the element which, through a whole set of rituals and trials, confesses that the crime took place, admits that the accused did indeed commit it, shows that he bore it and inscribed in himself and on himself, and it supports the operation of punishment punishment and manifests its effects in the most striking way. He talks about its complex social function in rule number one. Torture serves a judicio-political function, a judicial function in the sense that it affirms and produces truth, and yes. a political function in having to do with establishing the king as the ultimate superiority, which is, which is both establishing truth and a sort of reestablishing a system of politics. Like, you can signify on someone's body, you can use somebody as an example, essentially, where their body yeah. becomes a sign of the crime. Please. If you mess around and steal from me, I'll cut off your hand, and so that way, when everyone sees that you have, a, like, a stump for a hand, they will know both of my power over you and, like, everyone around, and then also that the, the crime has been permanently labeled on you. It makes the king very visible, though, is the thing. Mm -hmm. And so everybody knows who not to cross right. with the public execution. You don't cross the king. You can whip up the crowd in such a way where they actually identify with the criminal as opposed to the sovereign. Right, which would happen fairly often, according to Foucault. And which would directly us... threaten the, the sovereign's power. Yeah, yeah. He would give us examples of, uh, of instances in which the executioner would mess up or he was in a, he was unable to follow like the correct series of events in torturing someone or executing someone and the crowd would uh, protest as a result it was sometimes it was up to the the uh, observers almost like coliseum rule where like you know the old classic thumbs up thumbs down yeah. you ever see that movie gladiator when he tries um, to I... kill russell crowe uh, Joaquin Phoenix, he does the thumbs down to kill him, and then the whole crowd like boos. Crowds not happy. And, and then he has to change his thumb to up to like let him live. Right. That's like a perfect scene exemplifying the problem with public execution and torture. You gotta either back down 
or face over throughout. Yeah, and it's indicative of a major instability in all authoritarian role, or at least this sort of uh, mon monarchical role. Yeah, uh, he has he has a good quote Foucault. I can't. I'm not gonna be able to quote it exactly, but he says that authoritarianism inherently calls forth rebellion, and rebellion calls forth authoritarianism. That's a vital point to make uh, when making more points about the transition to a new penal system, the sort of instability and its lack of consistency. You know, that's yeah. it's basically uh, what the reformers, Foucault argues that the reformers were uh, critiquing. Uh, they were calling out uh, their governments or their, their leaders' use of these forms of punishment that were apparently very cruel, arbitrary, and inconsistent. They were giving out a really specific critique of torture and public execution. I think that people were starting to see inconsistencies. The risk of offending the masses became too great. They needed to find a system that required more stability. Also, what we're seeing is a shift towards capitalist production at this time that can't be ignored. Right. And I think that capitalism uh, can function, but it requires a very particular set of conditions to function. And I think one of them is a, a stable society. And so they needed to get more efficient mechanisms of creating a stable society than pure terror and fear. And, and starting to think of us as a society as opposed to as a sovereignty changed yeah. a lot of this as well. It, it was no longer the criminal criminal has wronged the king. It's the, the criminal has wronged society at large. I think uh, an important idea in all of what you just said was uh, Foucault often talks about it as a, a more efficient economy of punishment. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he, I like when he uses the term economy to describe various uh, social functions. Uh, it's it's an interesting idea. the The whole idea or the whole critique the reformers were were mounting against these cruel forms of punishment wasn't necessarily that it was cruel or that it was inhumane. It was also importantly a critique of its inefficiency and its lack of economy. You know, uh, its excess. Because especially when the laws were at that time were becoming so much more so much more well defined and so much more specific to to crimes. The I society think... was urbanizing more so so now you had more people in these condensed spaces as well it was less this rural kind of feudal agricultural state that we were in mm -hmm. and so i think that we had to think of punishment differently you couldn't just do an execution in front of everybody in a city in the same way it wouldn't have the same effects and this is what around like the 1600s and early 1700s yeah. uh crime was becoming less violent and more predicated on on property, yeah, just as, misconduct as, around this prop around property. As like the enclosure movement start, I'm sure a bunch of people too are kicked off of communal land. Yeah, I, that's that's definitely something we have to take into account when explaining exactly why people are demanding for more economic forms of punishment. And yet he doesn't call it out. This is part of my beef. We've already we've already hit beef, but <laughs> I'll save that for later. But 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 yeah, I mean, um, but we should talk about exactly what the transition is from torture to what, and and how exactly it's more efficient and more economic. There was a trans like a transition transition period uh, between torture and prisons or, or uh, carceral forms of punishment. It was seated mainly in these reformers' critiques of uh, tor torture and public execution. It was like their ideal penal system. And this is where he begins quoting all these reformers like Beccaria and Servan, uh, those two guys that, that yeah. he quotes extensively, uh, Beccaria especially. But they, they envision this, um, what Foucault calls, I like it a lot, and we have it listed here, uh, the, uh, the semio-technique that is apparently more efficient and it functions a bit differently from the way torture and public execution. Yeah. I think he says that the, the goal of the semio-technique is the idea of the crime and punishment must be strongly linked and follow one another without interruption. When you have thus formed the chain of ideas in the heads of your citizens, you will then be able to pride yourselves on guiding them and being their masters. Mm. That's, that's Servan that said that. Servan. I like Servan. I think this was like a very experimental time, too, when they were trying a bunch of different stuff. 
Yeah. And what these guys came up with was that instead of each time someone commits an offense, put on this public and excessive display of, of punishment, yeah. perhaps instead we can prevent crime through these psychological apparatuses or through this connection in people's heads of, like he says, of crime and punishment so that there's like semi techniques. Yeah. That create obstacles to crime, you know, it, it, that there's this slightly, slightly greater disadvantage to committing a crime than one would gain from committing the crime, right? And that is the punishment. And so if everyone believes that, and if that's something uh, that everyone tells everyone else, then you will have, like Servan says, succeeded in being yeah. the masters. You're trying to internalize, like, law-abidingness. I'm going to go back to the chain, chain gang example. Yeah. The goal of the chain gang as a semi-technique is to get people to see work as how they are paying their debt to society. Mm-hmm. So like they've wronged society, their their crime and their punishment must be linked, and that link is like they now have to go and fix this, like they have to go fix parts of society. And it's it's habituating them towards work, I think, would be the what they were talking about in the in that time. Mm-hmm. Like I think that they saw the criminal as indolent lazy not working and so a big part of this was getting people to become an efficient member of this new society which prioritized the ability to work yeah yeah i think and this also points to the reframing of the criminal uh in this new sort of penal system or at least in this transition period uh people were began focusing not on the crime or the act of crime, but the person who was potentially to commit the crime, um, yeah. and and like a whole criminology sprung up. Who was a criminal? Where were they from? What what made them a criminal became a thing. The the whole like you had already mentioned a lot of your previous comments that there's a there's a, another frame shift or like a, a reverse. Power wasn't so clearly concentrated in one thing. It was now like evenly distributed in societies into the to the effect that when a crime, when a criminal commits a crime, they're not offending or insulting the, the sovereign, but they're insulting the society, which is everyone. If we, yeah, there's an interesting quote here that Foucault says, he's, a new economy of the power to punish was set in place to more efficiently distribute it so that it should be neither be too concentrated at certain privilege points, nor too divided between two opposing authorities, so that it should be distributed in homogeneous circuits capable of operating everywhere in a continuous way down to the finest grain of the social body. The criticism of the reformers was directed not so much at a weakness of the of cruelty to those in authority as a bad economy of power, uh, not to punish less, but to punish better. Yeah, that, I think that just gets at the, the sort of the logic of this transition. Basically, it seems to be predicated on an economy of punishment. We, be, we have to begin knowing our population or we have to begin sort of dealing not with the body but with the souls of the population right the subjects the, he, he picks a super unique time in which like in the 1700s and 1800s where these more efficient technologies of power are like necessary to, to maintain the function of society but what ends up happening is not their ideal uh, what ends up happening is the the prison system. The prison is the sort of new next big technology of, of power. and Yeah, so now we've transferred fully to discipline. Discipline is sort of this new, this next uh, technology of power, this next modality of power. And it's, it's continuing with this trend of the disappearance of the sovereign and uh, an appearance of democratic states and, and just uh, less concentrated forms of power. And it, it does follow from these reformers' critiques. It follows from their same logic, their same logic of efficiency and economy of punishment. Uh, but it has some really important differences. What ended up materializing from these reformers' critiques wasn't what they had intended, which was their semiotechnique of power, the linking of idea of uh, crime and punishment as, as a preventative measure. But what ended up happening was the prisons and uh, prison as yeah. a new technology of power. And a technology of the body, too. Like mm-hmm. what they thought would be correcting people's souls and reforming their mental outlook 
actually became a more refined technique of disciplining their their bodies. He he kind of looks at discipline and all these these modes on how how it disciplines bodies. I think what's important is that the logic is still there the logic of efficiency and economy is still there but yeah. it manifests itself not on the soul like these people are saying like through ideas but it, it refocuses in on the bodies not just the semi, not just a semi technique but an actual effect on the body which creates a soul right yeah that's important to get yeah, con- to construct a soul from a docile body the the whole the whole function of discipline to me is to create a subject from a docile body. I think is what the the formulation that Foucault was going for. He kind of goes over three main techniques of disciplinization. And maybe we can just go through the prison and, and explain yeah. exactly how these three techniques work in the prison. Um, distribution of space. That's an interesting one. I like that one a lot. It's probably my favorite one. I think in prison you see it all the time in terms of the spaces are so controlled. You, you live in this tiny box of sorts at all times. Where where you can put your body is is subject to to control by the the prison guards, the state. Yeah, that's sort of the whole point of prison is the yeah. control of where you put your body. You know, uh, you can put your body here, but you can't put your body there. And yeah. even more generally, your body has to stay within the confines of the prison there's something almost military about it too of like uh, prisoners have this like routine where they have to like get up be all in the same place stand by their cells like there's all sorts of like lines and bodily distributions to add to that just because it's a good point uh in the prison you see all sorts of functional sites like there's specific areas that are sectioned off for specific things like the cell, for example, is functional in that it, it isolates individuals. And, or I think a, a great example of a functional site is the site of solitary confinement, you know. Oh, yeah. Which is a crazy site or a crazy distribution of space. One, their body is limited into that space, and they also can't see anything outside that space, which is probably yeah. the worst. And so it's, they... also, it's also just a manipulation of what people can do with their bodies and, and also what people can see. You know, I think two points that I'm going to bring up on on top of this one in terms of distribution, there's kind of a hierarchy or like a rank in distribution that often occurs. Mm-hmm. Where and then you can see this in prisons all the time, where they have of like different types of prisoners go to different types of prisons. So like if you commit like a white collar crime, like tax evasion or embezzlement, you'll probably go to a minimum security white collar prison with other mm-hmm. equally minor offenders. Whereas if you kill somebody or you rob a bank, you'll probably go to a maximum security federal prison. Right. And you'll be in 23-hour cell lockdown and you'll have an hour break. And you'll be on the most maximum security. Or even if you, if you fight in prison or if you, you hurt somebody in prison, you'll go to a prison inside the prison. Like, they have these ranks of, <laughs> of how, how deep of trouble you're in. Until, obviously, solitary confinement is the, the ultimate punishment. Yeah. I think that um, one distribution that we're also seeing and how it's playing out throughout society, mm-hmm. uh, and Foucault talks about this a lot more in his book, Madness and Civilization, is that increasingly people who don't fit the social norm are being distributed outside of society. Like they're being taken away to mental wards and to work homes and to prisons. They're being shipped off to sites outside of society. Whereas before, the either the chain gang or the, the torture was a part of society. Now society is consciously separating out those who are not acceptable to society. Right. So that, that's a big... That's a big shift for discipline. Although that makes that reminds me, just to play devil's advocate, it reminds me of. Uh, I mean, exile's been around for a long time. Exile, I think, back in the old days was we're just going to send you to a different town, like go be free there. It doesn't yeah. maintain control over you in a disciplined space, like uh, like a prison. Like when society sends you to prison, they're sending you. They still control the prison. 
when society exiles you back in the in the ancient times, they're sending you to some place that they don't control. There's still that there's still that exclusion aspect of it. There's that limitation of where the body can go. You know, discipline wasn't invented in the 1700s. Like discipline's been around for as long as there's been people. Yeah, that's Foucault's but big it, point too. Yeah. So I think that yeah, of course there. I think there are germs of disciplinary pre- previous disciplinary modes in other systems. I think he talks about the monastic system as a disciplinary system that predates the disciplinary shift in society that we're talking about. Or these these new technologies to power. It's not that they're n- new and marvelous inventions of the era, but it's that it's just that old technology. These are now coming to the fore and be, being used, or old logics or old sort of modalities yeah, are being are used being in new ways. Reappropriated is like the exactly. right word to new context. I think we should talk about control of activity and about like the the time aspect of discipline. I like the time aspect of discipline. Well, I mean, I don't. It sucks. This is another one of those things where I see a lot of parallels with what Foucault is talking about in terms of the prison schedule. So Foucault talks a lot about prison schedules as like a way to control people by constantly keeping them occupied. And so from dawn till dusk, the prison kind of has this this routine to it of everything that's on this fixed schedule. Lights on, 7 o'clock, lights out, 8 p.m., and making sure that people are, are keeping on schedule becomes an integral part of discipline. And so I think that has a lot to do with the factory. I see a lot of parallel between the, the need to systematize means of production and the, this obsession with timetable keeping. Just Go like for timetables it. are also super important in agricultural societies because people always had to um, keep time in in order to ensure that their crops had had a maximum harvest. I think the elaboration of time became much more minute. Yes, like, exactly. minutes, like minutes don't really matter on a on a on a farm. Like it matters like daylight is important. Like have like doing things while it's still light out is important back in the day. But if you take a five minute break to take a swig of water or go to the bathroom or production is on a on a harvest cycle. The difference between these two uh, concerns with time is that agriculture was concerned with just that. It was concerned with systems of weather patterns uh, that happened over long periods of time, whereas discipline is concerned with the body, and the body deals with increments of time that are much smaller. So the most effective way to control someone then would be to control the seconds and the minutes and the hours. And it's and another good point that you also made was that it's each section of the day's time is relegated to something. So uh, Foucault's point is one of he calls uh, exhaustive use or everyone's labor power, everyone's capacity to act is uh, used exhaustively. I feel like one perfect example I have of this is I remember when I was younger and they used to have like uh, we did like a school trip. Somewhere we went to like Springfield, Illinois, like the capital. And so they just worked us all day from like six in the morning to like nine at night with like activities and bullshit. Right, right, right. And yeah. The whole, the whole idea of it was make the kids so tired that they don't like fuck around and do shit in the night. And I'm sure also the program, I mean, was for learning, right? So their idea of, of changing your minds is by. Subject, subjecting you to this strict time schedule or this time sca- uh, table as yeah. a means of disseminating knowledge or, or just changing you or as a means of disciplining you and, and making you understand something or yeah. whatever curriculum they were trying to teach you. And, here's how we, and that's how we can kind of see it as like a technology of power because it can be used in even this most micro of micro settings. Exactly. Well, a perfect example is... In the military, uh, the marching, you know, there's the song that's a perfect rhythm for walking. It's a perfect perfect structure for the act of marching. Is the left, 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 right, left. Everyone's eat down to the very you know millisecond. That's like you know, that whole like basic training is basically all that. Like just timetable, timetable, like control everything. 
Exactly. All these can be found in the military. It, yeah. it, and many of them were, were actually first created in the military. I think he talks about that a little bit in terms yeah. of the, the, the standardization of having, before there wasn't sitting armies where you permanently had a base of military for people who were professionals. And I think one of the things that changes with the creation of permanent armies is this, these new forms of discipline also are used for that. Yeah, I think that's a vital point. You're right. Well, I think uh, we can keep going with the with the prison example here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, just as like a as a good case study for all the all the mechanisms and functions he's talking about. You know, this is the big transition. Realizing judgment is a big is a big portion of the prison. So I feel like well, I think the first part of it was like about more about controlling bodies. This to me, like the whole idea of surveillance and normalizing judgment is all about internalizing discipline into yourself so like like the primary function of surveillance is to get you to assess your own behavior and to have the knowledge that someone is watching you influence your behavior and i i also think it's it follows that same logic of the reformers they were using in their their semio technique of signs and ideas it's still super economic. As a matter of fact, it might even be more economic if uh, if properly done than than the semio technique. I think just the big point about surveillance and this new regime of discipline in general are these technologies of power. Foucault says he explicitly says it's the implementation of simple instruments, and and it's it's markedly different from that comparison to or that from torture and public execution where it's all sort of it does involve details but it's all located in these spectacles you know that happen sort of one at a time whereas this new regime relies on these simple instruments that are always in use and distributed throughout space and i think surveillance is an interesting one in that it it demands the most efficient uh, I, I keep bringing up this point, but the most efficient geometry of a space. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so, and I think this is a good point to transition to Panopticon as, as a sort of manifestation of this technology. Yeah, it's like this tower that's in the center of a prison in which all the cells are see-through. So from the tower, you can see into all the cells but they can't see into the tower. So they're always potentially being watched by the guards. They don't know whether or not they're being watched. They always have to assume they they are being watched, and so they they internalize the the gaze of the guard into themselves. If you internalize the the thought that you're being watched, you'll be disposed to, to behave in accordance with the norms of the watchers. Exactly. Oh, well, you begin watching yourself as a result. Yeah. Uh, I'll bring it up again just to drive the, the drive the point home. Uh, it's really efficient <laughs> at at getting a bunch of people to do a specific thing or act a specific way. You don't need to do all these things that were once necessary f- to maintain order. You know. Yeah, I think it, the the Panopticon's so cool to me because it's both real in the sense that it could physically exist as like a building but it's also like archetypal and that it is like a collective almost image of surveillance it's perfect it's a perfect model of its function Mm -hmm. of its idea and of its logic yeah there's a great quote on it that I, i could do right now the major effect of the panopticon to induce in the inmate a state of consciousness and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. So to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects, even if discontinuous in its actions, the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary that this architectural apparatus should be a machine for creating and sustaining a power relation independent of the person who exercises it. In short, that the inmates should be caught up in a power situation of which they themselves are the bearers. 
I love I love the line that he uses where he says that the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary. And I think this goes to so much of why why there's a need to revolutionize these technologies of power. Because true power is when you don't even need to use your power, but you just have authority. And so I think that we can see that shift kind of take place from torture to discipline. The soft fibers of the brain form the soundest foundations of great civilizations or something like that. It's not iron chains or materialities of, of punishment and restriction that make societies stable. It's soft fibers of the brain. It's influence over, yeah. the, person's, what, over the person's soul. And it's done through an exercise of the body. I think surveillance just manifests itself. I don't know. It seems to reverse that. It seems to affect the soul first and then affect the body afterwards. It produces like a consciousness of the body as a, a as an object, and it makes them aware of the the power relationship. I think too, it makes them aware that there is a watcher, uh, they're being judged. I think this is where judgment comes into effect too. Is like another one of the kind of technologies of power and of discipline. There's a good quote here: "The judges of normality are present everywhere." We are in a society of the teacher judge, the doctor judge, the educator judge, the social worker judge. It is on them that the universal reign of the normative is based, that each individual, wherever he may find himself, subjects to his body, his gestures, his behavior, his aptitudes, his achievements. And I think this is just a good quote to, it also sort of suggests his theory about um, power and knowledge and how with every technology of power, uh, there's this epistemology, you know, there's this epistemology that comes with it. And in this case, it's an epistemology centered around like the individual as an object of knowledge. I got another great uh, quote for it. There is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. Yeah, exactly. That's where the whole surveillance and judgment kind of meet a nexus, where you're gathering all this information about people and assessing them so that they can be judged and ranked and, and hierarchized and, and put into different disciplinary spaces. It's just all really good examples of his theory of power and how it functions. The last section of the book, he basically... He kind of just tries to push it beyond prisons. I mean, he's kind of done this a little bit throughout the book in terms of referencing schools and factories and hospitals. This is important, yeah. I think it's, a, it's important to note that this book isn't just about the criminal justice. You know, it's, it makes a, a, a greater point about technologies of power and how sort of those that benefit from power are always adapting new technologies to control people. And that what we once thought was, or once what revision, anti-revisionists once thought was a progressive transition to more humane punishment is actually very political and serves other functions or serves similar functions. A more efficient mode of the same, same goal. The goal hasn't changed, basically. And the same logic sort of creeps its way into all, all parts of society, I think, is Foucault's point. That yeah. everything is sort of suffused in, this, in these modes of relations that are, that are dictated by power. Um, and it's sort of unavoidable. And disciplinization is just one sort of historical period of it. You know, Do you mind that, if I read uh, the last line of the whole book? I think it like, kind of goes for what we're, what we're talking about right now. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. Okay. He says, Is it surprising that the cellular prison, with its regular chronologies, forced labor, its authorities of surveillance and registration, its experts in normality, who continue to multiply the functions of the judge, should have become the modern instrument of penality? Is it a surprise that prisons resemble factories, schools, barracks, hospitals, which all resemble prisons? 
And I think that I think that's the major point that he kind of ends with is that the same things that are going on in prison are happening throughout society. These same technologies of power that are used in prison are used in your church, in your school, in your hospital. And I think it's important to to recognize that. And I think he wants us to to be critical of how we treat prisoners because it's how we treat everybody. It, it seeps into every one of our institutions. The same underlying needs for efficiency have driven the development of all these institutions, I think, is what Foucault mm-hmm. would say, is that we, we are, these, all these institutions are dealing with similar problems in how do we control and discipline the populations that we have to deal with. It, it sort of also suggests this question of agency, like where is the agency in Foucault's um, theory of power? or at least in, in his theory of, of the uh, crime and punishment, you know, like who exactly are the people that are implementing these, these, uh, these programs of discipline, you know, or, and who exactly are the people that are, that are also implementing them in schools and, and like who, to whose benefit, like uh, where is, or is that even a fair question to ask, you know, is it structure or is it agent? I think it's definitely a fair question to ask. I think that he he says that all of these things happen, but he doesn't assign it to any particular person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think it's... That, go ahead. I think this is where the question of Marxism enters into it, too, is, like, to what extent is he, is he talking about a, a self-conscious ruling class that is doing all this? Right, I mean... Is it a class? Is, is it a class argument? Is he making the the argument that higher classes are going to implement? Are the ones that are innovating these technologies of power? Are they the ones that are innovating and implementing them, or is it just this like sort of natural? I don't. I don't think he argues that that it's a natural development of that's like technological determinism, but or that um, it's like social diffusion would maybe be what he would be. Something that something that he could potentially say. Could instead you define of, social diffusion? Or instead of it being solely the responsibility or the product of the ruling class, it could be a relationship between the ruling class, like how the ruling class socially relates to the underclasses. Just like this inherent conflict of interests. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, it, the point is, is that it's unclear. I mean, essentially, the question is like, what is the cause? of these transitions. The people who are in power are probably really influenced by the reformers. I mean, they had legitimate critiques that were already based in Enlightenment reasoning, you know, which was sort of the norm of the time. So people probably would have been very receptive to policy deciders or people who are in charge of policy. And and so, you know, you, you can't help but think but that, um, that there are specific Specific individuals that are sort of key, uh, or just like a specific class of individuals that are key to implementing these uh, these powers, and it makes sense when you consider their interests and their incentives, their desire to maintain control. You know, and I, I yeah, I think it's important to note like who these kind of Enlightenment thinkers were, in terms of they were white men from like rich white men, Europe who were often slave owners like John Locke owned slaves and I know some of the others and so I think that that there's that important element of just a a common class agreement on certain things that comes from all being developed with similar interests I mean like people are going to have desires right regardless of what situation they're in and people in a specific class are simply going to have those desires directed into a thing that's class specific. You know, uh, it's like a combination of of psychology and the context that that psychic individual is enmeshed in. It's like uh, I'm always going to experience hunger, but experiencing hunger in a authoritarian state is going to be is going to drive me to do a lot of different things than when I experience hunger in a democratic liberal state. We're always going to have of needs, but they're sort of according to our conditions, if that makes sense. There's just this economy of, of needs and desires that need to be maintained by those in control. I think this is where he's really missing 
the psychoanalytic insight and is not asking the psychoanal like the basic psychoanalytic question of like where does our desire for power come from like right. he, he seems to assume that desire is natural and doesn't yeah. kind of do, do the work to say like what like what sort of enjoyment is there in power or what sort of jouissance is being derived from the exercise of power and domination i think there is a huge element of that that is that is being ignored in his work no yeah i agree he, he never really takes it down to like the experience he does talk about the experience of power because he talks about it in such detailed way and like the, the way time is ordered and the way space is ordered but, but i think but he's missing an affective and emotional dimension of it yeah true true so it's described kind of totally atonally without the proper affective content he, he acknowledges that everyone is sort of experiencing it uh in similar ways but he never talks about uh, just other vectors of identity like gender or or race or nationality or what have you you know and maybe that's exactly the the psychoanalytic bit he's missing just these various ways in which people identify. They're not just sheep, you know. They, they have complex identities. Uh, I wonder if I, we can transition to the racial one from this. Yeah, I think he misses um, how, how technologies of power were developed in racist contexts, and I feel like in colonial contexts as well. So, because I True. feel like Right before the the whole revolution in prisons, from torture to to towards prisons, during the same time, all these European countries that are implementing these reforms are also have colonies. The United States has slavery, so that there's all these parallel kind of racist institutions which have their own technologies of power and discipline that are, I think, being been imported into. Our, our understanding of criminal justice. And this is especially evident if you look at the, the prison, uh, the history and legacy in the United States. And I think that, yeah, coming from our context, it, it's so clear that the development of the U.S. prison system is intimately involved with the decline of the slave system once the, the end of the Civil War happened. Yeah, I mean, it seems like almost like a glaring, um, like he has all these examples from all these different parts of society, like it's. But it's, he seems to be always looking within the territory of the society and the ways it implements itself there. And I know that slavery can also exist within the society that that uh, uses it. But I mean, like colonial studies, for example, he doesn't even touch uh, because at the same time that all these transitions are happening. The same countries that he's talking about are busy colonizing and enslaving and putting a bunch of people to work across the world, you know? Exactly, yeah. And Millions of people in, in prison-like countries. I mean, granted, colonialism and imperialism is economy. It is a manifestation of economy, but it, it produces racism and just all, the, all these other sorts of hierarchies, you know? Yeah, and you, you can see all these technologies of power reproduced in racial systems, like the whole idea of like separating out slaves into different hierarchies of slaves, where you had like maybe like a like a house and a field slave mm -hmm. dichotomy, or if you have like overseers who are watching the slaves, you have this sort of surveillance component of it. it it's so it's so weird to me that he doesn't trace that that parallel development that's occurring in the economic sphere and and that's not to say that that he seems to be making the argument that these technologies of power are somewhat conditioned by economic demands right that, which is a point we've been hearing throughout our our, uh, our podcast thus far but um and racism is also a manifestation of economic demands you know uh slavery was uh, access to free labor and racism was the legitimization of it, right? Yeah. And just the fact that discipline played such a big role in the creation of racism, and now that racism is a thing, you know, like a ideology, 
it, yeah. it plays such a big role in the implementation of discipline of discipline and whatnot. Uh, yeah, you, and you totally see that in the the current mass incarceration system that we have here. I think there are now more black people in in modern prisons than there were slaves, and I think that there, and, there's still a lot of domination and control of black bodies, and the the, the need to control black bodies is an ever present social demand right of our society i think it would be interesting to talk about a specific part of foucault's theory the 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 idea that every power comes with its own knowledge yeah maybe the argument could be made that in america the power to punish was used to construct a knowledge or an epistemology of racism if i don't know if that's a, a fair statement to make like the the same yeah. techniques that were used to to gain knowledge about individuals and and rank them and organize them was the same technologies of power that were used to construct race and organize people according to their skin color definitely uh, it's not that his theory can't account for it it's just that he just seems not to use it as an example you know and I think we see the same movement that we, that Foucault documents in discipline and punish from the transition to torture to the transition to prison, where we see the transition from slavery to Jim Crow, segregation, mass incarceration, and other methods. I think we see the same idea of what was before a general terror is now a highly sophisticated and specific tool of bodily domination but it still retains that brutal kernel of the old system or i think there's this, this horrible thing with some people might be like so what we have all these um disciplinary systems and i think the example of jim crow and the the horrible racist atrocities of that can be are, are the, the counterexample of when we have these disciplinary systems in place, we can use them for horrible, horrible ends. It's true. It's the same. It's literally the same systems. Yeah, you know? these same systems can be turned on vulnerable populations. Yeah, and I, that's probably how ethnicity and nationality is probably so entrenched. Because once the state starts organizing you according to your skin color or however it chooses to organize you, you know, it's just another means of constructing individuals or individuality. I think that's an interesting point you said about constructing individuality. Cause I remember when we were talking about this and our beef with the, his missing the racial component, mm -hmm. I feel like in prisons, there's such a big racial component when you go into them. Yeah. Nowadays, if you're white in most prisons, like you have to hang out with exclusively white people. And you have to join the white power gang. There's like specific, like specific in, internal gang like codes of conduct of like how you're supposed to interact with other races. If Foucault really doesn't talk about that all that much, um, no. I don't think he mentions at all. Just like the the relationships of people experiencing this diffuse dom domination and discipline. I don't know. I think that's why there's something he does say about like tattooing in there where people mark their their criminality on them. He's talking mm -hmm. about like prisoners back in the day. He does he barely just barely touches on it, but that identity construction aspect is so crucial. Cause I feel like a lot of people before they go into prison, they don't think of themselves as like a certain race so consciously. And then oh, when yeah. you get in there, everything is about or so much of the your internal inter-prison relations is all about the, your identity, your your gang identity, your affiliation. It's true. It's true. And even in schools, and in and in other places, the same the same sort of more complex desires than Foucault might than Foucault mentions are in play. Like uh, at least in my high school, the in my public high school, there was the most of the news about the high school wasn't about uh, the grades of the students or the accomplishments of the students. It was about like ethnic violence that was being committed on on school grounds. Like Whoa. just kids would, there would just be like, for example, the Arabic kids would uh, gang up against the black 
kids and I don't think the white kids were ever a, a, an actual group, but just these, and there was also the Hispanic group. There was just these groups that would form and, and I feel like kids, when they go to school, a lot of what they experience is obviously the, the discipline that's ingrained in, in the in you know in the literal walls and in the surveillance and in the normalizing judgments but it's also their experience is also so much structured by around these these relations they have with other students whether they be a part of their group or or enemies you know and i feel like that's like what, what when kids are anxious they're really anxious about shit like that you know I feel like there's an interesting sort of transference that happens when people are oppressed by these structures and they turn that oppression around into something like anti-ethnic, like, like, like in your school, like I'm sure. Right. If society is beating down or, or if those kids are, are being affected by society in some way, they get angry and they take it out on this other ethnic clique or... Well... Maybe that's the explanation for why schools are the grounds for so much rebellion and, I don't know, like some bad shit happens at schools, you know, just between kids. School is like a terrible place sometimes oh, yeah. uh, to be as, a, as an adolescent, you know. Maybe it's exactly because it's a place of discipline and so kids are going to redirect that dissatisfaction onto each other. You know, yeah. or redirect that experience of discipline and the anger they have concerning that discipline. They'll project it onto each other and form groups and commit violent acts. Yeah, I feel like he really doesn't touch on, like, brut- discipline breeds brutality. It does. It does. So the, like, the more disciplined, like your, your, like, your little society is, like, the more, the more it'll fuck it up. Yeah, I mean, Full Metal Jacket. You ever see that movie? Oh, I love that movie. That's a great. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's exactly what I was reminded of. I mean, it's the it's another space. It's another space where just really fucked up shit can happen. Or the space being like the military camp or or the the outpost or whatever what whatever you want to call it, a place of discipline, regimen, and surveillance. You know, it's gonna it has an effect on people's psyches. This is where I think that whole component of trauma comes in. Yeah, I think that the, that's like another crucial element that's kind of missed. Mm-hmm. That I think when there's a, a situation where there is like trauma, like that 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 when that isn't articulated or developed in any way psychoanalytically or like is that uh, that isn't analyzed, it can be reproduced in like a certain way. Right. Like when you repress something, it comes back in a different manifestation, and I think that people repress their relationship to disciplinary institutions and then act out their their repressed feelings towards these disciplinary institutions on on others that's such a cool concept that that idea of transference and it's it's completely situated in the subjectivity it, it just that's the what it hinges on it's that the subjectivity internalizes some sort of bad situation and then externalizes it in a sort of contradictory way and sometimes anger is projected onto something that it shouldn't be projected onto like yeah like someone with a, a different skin tone than you or something yeah i think that's why people do shit in prison that they would never do outside of prison yeah true like sometimes people are walking around angry in prison and they just start a huge fight or like a riot or like a race war or something like that and it, it's not because of the other person all the time it's sometimes just because of the situation that they're in I was just, it's an interesting idea uh, thinking about the toll that di- that this regime of discipline takes on people's subjectivity, on people's psychology, which is why I've always been interested in, in the idea of studying mental health and over just various regimes of oppression and how mental health is affected. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure that this regime of discipline that, re- that Foucault talks about has a whole set of consequences on people's mental health, all these little subtle uh, obstacles to our, our desires, and whether it be in the form of laws and the way they're enforced or, or the way that we have to adhere to norms. You know, I'm sure it takes, it's very stressful, I'm sure. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a, a point that the prison abolition movement 
likes to try to like impress upon people mm-hmm. who struggle to understand prison abolition because it's a when you first hear it it's a ridiculous statement right like abolishing prison sounds like you would abolish a hospital like would you like it's like a it, it, it's inherently absurd but i think what people fail to perceive is that prison is a form of violence and, and encourages further brutality and violence and that's something that we also need to to question to what extent are we okay reproducing these brutal conditions and having this be a part of our society? And this is healthy for our overall society. You're right. I mean, if it's the if it's the case that Foucault doesn't touch on every necessarily every case he could touch on, like race, for example, it is also the case that he provides the tools necessary to analyze them. You know, or like yeah. a, a set of tools that undercut a lot of assumptions we make about. The naturalness of of punishment or or of like the organization of of space even you know like our cities or towns the way or even buildings themselves are organized you know it makes you think about but maybe it is actually uh, the result of some sort of history of power yeah yeah i feel like the whole the thing is the way it is is like is what we're trying to we're trying to avoid yeah, if you don't uh, want to change something, just say it's inevitable, and you can you can call it quits. Yeah, or it's inevitable, and it's good, and it's reasonable, and it's progressive. Then you can continue doing it. You know. Yeah. Um, those are all pretty effective ways of doing it. I think he's somebody who who can be used in conjunction with Althazar too. I, that's an interesting kind of thing to to bring up because I mean those of you who listened to the last podcast we were talking a lot about ideological systems and I think that there's a, a definite relationship between ideological uh, apparatuses and technologies of power and For there's sure. a, a significant overlap and so if you're theorizing I don't know ideological apparatuses you, you could always incorporate an understanding of technologies of power and vice versa yeah, I agree. I, I think Foucault's theory of, the, of, of these technologies of power as having to do with object relations and, and the control of the body is really similar to Althusser's idea that ideology functions in this reversed way and that ideological apparatuses are a set of practices. Or it's not so much that believing will make you kneel and pray it's that kneeling and praying is what will make you believe pascal made that quote is that who it was yeah or someone like that i don't know Foucault has a similar point i think his whole theory hinges or a lot large part of his theory hinges on that point that uh it's the it's the manipulation of bodies that is used as a technique to manufacture the soul or manufacture individuals and produce ideology within them. Exactly, yeah, to make people think a certain way. So the, the Foucaultian addition to the Pascal quote would be, you kneel and you pray because you're a good little docile body that is being formed to the ideology. Yeah. he's sort of just ex- explaining why it is the kneeling and why it is the praying, like why we kneel in a certain space or why we pray at a certain time in a certain day of the week and yeah. why we pray for... A certain extension of time and and he's just sort of sort of explaining the logic of all these rituals you know and yeah all these technologies all these tech not yeah that these technologies that are yeah co-constitutive of ideology right and as a result dispelling the myth that that there's this progression of civilization and modernization that happens and, and liberalization of states over time um i think that's and, a great place to leave it if yeah just that connection to is there it's a, it's a good it's a good example yeah for those who made it all the way through this episode and and those who made it all the way through the last episode thank you for that yeah seriously um so yeah we've been the armchair theorists i'm nicholas that's tyler we're we putting out something in i want to say the near future i mean we're both locked down for this this pandemic so in quarantine so uh, we'll probably have extra time to be doing episodes more frequently yeah 
if you have any suggestions for us of stuff to read or possibly do episodes on, please let it comment it or send us a message. Our email's somewhere in there. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. Also, shout out Fabulizer, who made our sick intro beat. Sick oh. intro and outro uh, beat. Yeah, probably playing over this right now. 